I have the privilege and pleasure to introduce my friend Peter, who just finished his new book called The Space Economy Transformation of the City. Quickly, my name is David Chung, co-founder and partner of DWP, Design Worldwide Partnership. DWP is a design firm with a dozen locations running from Middle East to Southeast Asia, totally over 500 people. Peter was our design director in DWP, specialized on urban planning. Me too, David. I'm very happy that you do this interview. Let's come to the subject, Peter. Your book was recently published with Springer. I read on the back cover some major items you developed in this book. Notably, you present four case studies in Europe and you finalize the book with a case study in Asia. What is the link between Europe and Asia? Uh, Europe has tremendous experience in the development of cities, but Europe also made some fundamental mistakes, mainly during the 19th and 20th century. To learn from experience is one of the fundamental principles of the space economic transformation of the city. Learning from experience, Peter, there is nothing special? For sure, but the space economic approach allows to fully valorize this experience it becomes possible to qualify and quantify the urban transformation process and to develop an effective benchmarking of the city. This overall benchmarking highlights what action comes first, what is second and third, and so on. This is essential for policymakers. It gives them an overall view and practical guidance to understand the urban transformation process in this complexity and to act effectively. Is it the reason why you call it space economy revolution? Uh, yes. In fact, the space economic urban uh, approach opens opportunities to satisfy essential needs of the population as a community. Peter. Your aim is to give policymaker overall view, a practical guidance to decide the effective way to transform the city towards sustainability. Seems very ambitious. Too ambitious? I simply hope that my book is understood as a contribution for professionals and policymakers to confront their experience. I recall the origin of your theory on space economy goes back to your professional experience in GLC, Greater London Council in the 70s. Later, you had the opportunity to develop this idea at urban scale in the big project in a near town near Paris. The project for the city centre of saint quentin en yvelines near Paris was the first application of the emerging space economic criteria. But of course, it was not fully developed, and many mis uh, mistakes could be changed today. In 2004, your first book was published in French and focused the same issue as the present book. But its approach was larger. You underlined the emergence of a completely new economic situation, isn't it? I started this first book with some basic statement. I underlined that space and time are two notions of everyday language. But when these two notions are faced with a third notion, economy, an amazing thing happens. Economy and time are associated. Time is money. This is absolutely not the case between economy and space or safe space, and above all, urban space, should be as obvious as safe time. Why? This is not the case? Recent history provides some answers. Economy keeps its time and space unity until the Renaissance. That marks turning point. Management and design become new intellectual activities as autonomous professions. Filippo Brunelleschi, Florentine architect, no longer works for one single prince, but makes projects for many clients. 
Luca Pacioli, Venetian monk, invent the double entry accounting along the ever growing manufacture. How this new profession developed later on? With the emerging capitalism, management evolves as major activity of production. Design is no longer of same importance. It is simply one among many other productive functions. The economic unity of space and time is broken. Management dominates design, time dominates uh, space. Produce profit as such becomes more and more important. What are the consequences? The lost unity between time and economy and the space economy is very fundamental reason for the ever-growing threat of climate change. What has to be done? To act effectively against climate change, the economic unity of space and time has to be re-established. Re How? Please develop further. The basic complementarities of time economy and space economy have to be valorized. The basic strength of the time economy is to re reduce time in the pro production processes, improve productivity, and increase profit. This is the very logic of capitalism. It creates exchange values, that is to say, goods that are exchanged in the market. The basic weakness of the time economy is a fragmentation of its processes and products. This weakness of the time economy can be compensated by the basic strengths of the space economics, by its capacity to connect many of these products offered on the market and integrate uh, them in the space economic transformation of the city towards sustainability as common use value of the citizens. So the space economy seems to open new opportunity, isn't it? Yes, to economize space opens opportunities, to economize matter and energy and to re reduce pollution. And in doing so, it also opens opportunities to economize time and save e uh, money. How can this opportunity be exploited? To answer this difficult question is the main objective of my book. Both economies are initially based on a linear development. Time can be converted into space, and space can be measured over time. For example, in the time of one hour, we can walk a distance of about five kilometers. Uh, transport uh, puts time and space even closer. So distance becomes a cost factor, not only in production, but also for people in their day-to-day -day life. Can you develop further? In physical terms, time cannot escape its linearity. Space, however, can be developed in its three dimensions, the line, the square, and the volume, the three dimension of the Euclidean geometry. Sure, your explanation makes sense, but all this remains very general. But practically, what do you propose? I show in my book that the whole process can be mastered within three disciplines, economy, geography, history. Three disciplines. What are the adequate criteria and concepts? Each one of these three disciplines is acting primarily in one of the three dimensions of the Euclidean space. The economy in its linearity, the geography in its two-dimensional chorology. Chorology represents the surface of the Earth. The history in the three dimensions of reality. Each one of these three disciplines is operated with its own criteria and concepts. What can be achieved? 
four case studies in four different countries in Europe presented in my book shows a significant process is achieved with an integrated urban policy. A city like Stockholm succeeded to reduce the annual pollution per person to three tons of CO2, whereas many cities produce 10, 20 or more uh, tons. So mobility is one of the ma major aspects. In Stockholm, 90% of commuters travel by tram and ferries or are walking and cycling. How these four cities achieve this result? Each city did it uh, in its own way. Uh, but they share the main criteria of urban sustainability related to energy, water, waste, transport, and above all, social criteria. These common criteria can now be integrated in the framework of the space economic approach. First, the progress becomes possible. Now I understand very clearly. Of course, this is only a part of your general framework that you develop step by step in your book. Once present a four case study in Europe, you demonstrate that all the main indicators can be integrated in an orderly way, in the framework of a diagram with a set of seven space economic indicators for sustainable city. In fact, the most important space economic qualities of the cities are unified by seven space e economic indicators. Can you explain? These seven space economic indicators are developed in a combined bottom-up and top-down strategy. At the bottom, you have the three basic economic criteria, the distance, the density, and the mix. And these three criteria are mainly developed by professionals. On the top, in the top-down strategy, you have the decisions by the policy makers. And they have to determine the ratio of urban land, private land to public land, and the ratio of public space, what in public space you uh, need for streets and motorized circulation, and on the other hand, for urban activities. In the middle, you have the two energy surfaces. On one hand, the sealed surfaces of the street, and on the other hand, the insulated surfaces for the buildings. What is the result? What are the benefits for the population? Within this conceptual and operational framework, the city of sustainability is developed as city of proximity with short distances, city of compactness with optimal densities, and city of adaptability with its functional, social, and cultural mix open to changing needs. These qualities become possible with diversified traces of mobility, with streets, rivers, and through green areas, and building clusters of flexibility with a variety of buildings. Both the streets and the buildings are linked by areas of accessibility as places of exchange, communication, in and interaction. I wish to add a final question. Your book has many facets. It can be first be bronze like a picture book with hundreds of photos, plans and figures. These illustrations are of great importance. In introducing the case study in Ho Chi Minh, you write a new world is possible. And you add picture expressed better than word is two opposing worlds. Could you comment this statement? Two pictures express these two opposing worlds. On one side, there are speculative clusters of residential high-rise buildings, dense, but without real urban life. On the other side, there are new areas where popular urban life, so characteristic to Ho Chi Minh City, can be maintained. 
to conclude, the sustainable city is a city for a citizen, all his citizens, rich and poor. Yes, it is above all a lively city, a city of great urbanity, opposed to social and spatial segregation. Such areas exist in Ho Chi Minh City, areas of solidarity and security, areas with opportunities to develop activities and earn some money. And these areas are realized with low-rise, high-density buildings. Nyabe, a neighborhood in a recent project for 30,000 people in the south of Ho Chi Minh City, was developed along these urban and social principles. If I understand well, social and spatial segregation are the ban of modern city. Today, in most new urban areas, it is ignored that social and spatial segregation creates sooner or later many fold problems that require highest public expenditures leading in general to unsatisfactory solutions. Awareness of this issue is urgent. A final point. Why the importance of the space economy is not widely recognized? I suppose it is the blinding proximity of the space economy.